Um, I wanted to welcome you all to our webinar. This is being hosted by the Climate, NOAA Climate Program Office. The name of the webinar is Water in the Great Lakes in a Changing Climate in the Realm of Earth System Science. You can see we tried to get every word we could in that webinar title, but there you go. That's it. Today we have um, four different speakers, and what I'm going to do is give each of the speakers about 15 minutes. I'll give you like a one or two minute warning before um, your time is up. And uh, then what we'll do is after we'll take a question or two after each speaks and move on to, to the next speaker. Um, before I move on, what I want to do is tell you this is a two-part webinar. Uh, this part is more on the, the physical realm. Um, it's, we're looking at earth system science and modeling. The second one, which will be in January, um, January 10th, actually, at 2 o'clock, and more information will follow, uh, will be more focused on the societal interaction. Before I go on, um, this is Nancy Beller Sims within the Climate Program Office. Uh, with me is Todd Christensen, as well as uh, Jen Dubkowski. Um, so, what I'd like to do is go ahead and start and and let me just give a brief introduction to you, and we'll, we'll move on from there. We have uh, Dr. Edward Rutherford on the line. He's a research fisheries biologist. Um, this is Brent. We, we had uh, sort of settled on the order that I'm going to go first, and then Drew, okay. and then me, Ed, and then uh, Greg. Greg. Is that okay? Fantastic. It's fine. This is this is going to be, you know, the more we learn, the better. So let's start again. Hi, we're going to start with Brent, and let me give Brent um, the background. Thank you. Um, coming in late to this, uh, Brent Lofgren is a physical scientist at the uh, NOAA Squirrel. Um, and the Squirrel, for those who really don't know this, is the Great Lakes Environment Research Laboratory. Um, Brent holds a a PhD in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences from Princeton. Um, he's worked on issues of climate and climate change in the Great Lakes Basin, including intersections with shipping, fisheries, and other sectors. He's the author of many peer-reviewed articles and is working on a book tentatively titled, It's Not Obvious, Processes That Control Climate. Okay, Brent, go for it. Okay. Um... I submitted the title of this talk before we had really coordinated on it, and uh, <clears throat> therefore, um, part of my content will, will be uh, according to this title, but uh, there's, there's going to be others that uh, right up front will be sort of an introduction to the Great Lakes, and there will be some more aspects of the Great Lakes physical system included as well. So, there we go. Um, this is a basic uh, vertical profile of the Great Lakes, and uh, you can get some idea of, of the size of them uh, and uh, the, the flow between the lakes. So uh, Drew is actually going to deal with this some more later in his talk. And then the next slide is actually going to be a short video produced here that uh, gives some general information about the Great Lakes. Thank you. 
All right, so uh, that that gives you an introduction and gives you an idea of the magnitude of the Great Lakes that we're dealing with. And uh, yeah, sorry, we're trying to clear up the screen here. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm hoping some of the listeners are surprised at, at some of the figures that were presented there. Okay, here's the next slide. Um, I wanted to go over some of the uh, distinctions between the, the world's oceans and the Great Lakes in terms of their, their impact on climate and the, uh, the Im impact of climate on them. Um, and one of the things that I emphasize is that, uh, and, and this is actually going to be a fairly prominent part of the book that was mentioned that I'm working on, is climate depends on surface atmosphere interaction and um, people get a little bit of a skewed idea from listening to weather reports about uh, how much the atmosphere controls everything. Uh, the atmosphere is very important on shorter time scales and the, the uh, interaction between the surface and the atmosphere is of uh, utmost importance on longer time scales. Um, then uh, the oceans are able to transport heat uh, throughout their entire extent, which uh, goes all the way up to the North Pole and uh, not too far from the South Pole. And um, they are able to store heat on multi-century timescales. The, the Great Lakes, even though they are among the deepest lakes in the world, still do respond on a much shorter time scale uh, because they have no permanent thermocline. They completely mix every year, or at least historically do. Uh, there's, there's actually a, um, a suspicion that they might stop completely mixing each year as a result of warming. Um, and uh, the, the lines of latitude there, 42 and 46 degrees north, are the approximate extent of Lake Michigan. So that's kind of the, the largest north-south um, circulation that you might get in the Great Lakes. Um, and they influence weather and climate on a regional sca uh, spatial scale. One of the particular weather phenomena is lake effect precipitation. And we've usually referred to this in the past as lake effect snow, but there's a likelihood that we'll get more lake effect rain in the future. Uh, so one of the issues with the Great Lakes is the quantity of water that's in them and the water levels. And um, the, the thing that mechanism that controls the water levels in the Great Lakes is different from in the ocean uh, in, due to the fact that the Great Lakes have outlets. So their water level is controlled by the net amount of water that is running into the lakes and can be, um, can be dampened over time by the outflow through those. Whereas in the ocean, the expectation is rising water levels and that's assuming um, <clears throat> basically a constant amount of water mass in the oceans but decreased density due to heating and that's the mechanism for that's one of the mechanisms for rising in ocean levels along with melting of glaciers another fact about the great lakes is that um, the drainage basin is not all that large in comparison to the lakes so the the Drainage basin is about one third water by area, and that is very unusual worldwide for a drainage basin of this size. So some of the current and past research that we've done uh, related to Great Lakes climate has to do with uh, teleconnections and Great Lakes ice time series regional climate modeling, uh, working toward coupling th three-dimensional lake model with a general circulation model from GFDL, 
and then looking at past and future lake levels. Actually, Drew will be more dealing with that one. And um, Drew also had a, a very strong hand in initiating the next item that's listed, Great Lakes Evaporation Network, which is a, a group of, of A covariance measurements to, to get latent and sensible heat flux with latent heat flux also corresponding to evaporation from the lakes. So a little bit about the teleconnections to, to focus in on that. Um, some of the teleconnections that are believed to influence ice and other uh, climatic factors on the Great Lakes are North Atlantic Oscillation, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, ENSO and Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. And the one that really has the most prominent influence on the Great Lakes is uh, shown in the, the upper left here is the circulation associated with the North Atlantic Oscillation. And uh, depending upon the phase of that, that'll bring uh, either war unusually warm or cold air into this region. Um, and the, uh, there's a linear fit shown to the North Atlantic Oscillation at the bottom. And uh, <clears throat> you may have to use your imagination a little bit to, uh, to realize the, the uh, parabolic fit that's shown for the ENSO phase on the right. Um, but North Atlantic Oscillation seems to have the, the strongest influence one of the drawbacks of that is it's much less predictable and has much less uh, much less persistence than the ENSO signal. Okay, here are some of the results of regional climate modeling that we've done, or uh, dynamical downscaling is another term that people use. So we ran the uh, WARF model weather research and forecasting model with its uh, lake component, which uses one dimensional vertical diffusion to uh, give temperature profiles of the lakes. And this is showing uh, in the vertical dimension, it's, it's depth in the water column, and in the horizontal dimension, it's day of the year. Um, so on the left is shown the historical uh, simulated lake temperatures. And the, uh, the red circle there is showing the thermocline, which uh, in the historical time period is relatively weak compared to on the right, that's showing a late 21st century uh, simulation using a, the, uh, the uh, representative RCP 8.5, representative concentration pathway. And so that's, that's one, of the, uh, one of the stronger responding scenarios uh, that's available. So it's really showing that the lake starts warming up earlier in the year and that that results in a stronger gradient of temperature in the vertical and that uh, that is both a result of and a result in a stronger stratification in the lake. Then uh, something that I've been working on is the use of the finite volume community ocean model, which is uh, something that's used as a, a three-dimensional dynamical model of the Great Lakes and putting that within the GFDL GCM. And I, I spent the summer of 2018 in residence out at uh, GFDL working on this. So um, the idea here is to have a direct two-way coupling between a global model and uh, the Great Lakes scale dynamical model of the water. Um, 
one of the alternatives that we thought about and rejected was the uh, actually using GFDL's ocean model, which uh, has much coarser resolution than would really be relevant to the Great Lakes. Um, and I'll mention that minimal human resources are currently dedicated. I, I'm kind of working it on it as a, on a catch as catch can basis. So this is one of the phenomena that we're really interested in capturing by having that dynamical model going. So where you see these people standing up on top of a pile of ice several feet below them in the summer is water. Uh, so this is just ice piled up on the shoreline of Lake Superior and uh, presumably there was a wind event that, that happened earlier that just blew this ice on shore and the uh, weather and climate response to having ice piled up on shore is much different from what you'd expect from having that same ice spread across the lake. So uh, the final part of my presentation is just listing these research knowledge gaps. Uh, so we want to expand the GCM usage to a three-dimensional lake model. Historically, at best, they've used a one-dimensional lake model. M many of them have just considered this area to be land. <clears throat> and uh, we want to use that to make the linkage between water and energy budgets and lake and land. Uh, then one of the things we want to consider is the connection between the Arctic climate and high latitude uh, and mid-latitude climate. And um, I think Drew is going to speak to this more. This is, uh, there's, there's some research going on about stability of jet streams and, and polar vortices that, that have to do with this uh, temperature gradient. Then uh, we wanna have more measurements and observations on ice and uh, ice extent and ice thickness, full profile water temperature measurements year round at more sites, really the only long term measurement of uh, the profile of temperature is at one station in southern Lake Michigan. Then uh, <clears throat> um, ice transport as far as modeling, uh, which what I was just mentioning, and then um, there can be storm surges. Uh, there, there was an incident of, of ice combined with a storm surge and combined with high water. Uh, people near Buffalo ended up having ice just piling up on their back patio. So that was, that was a major event. Um, and then these uh, Great Lakes uh, evaporation network stations also have the capability of measuring CO2 fluxes. Um, essentially those measurements are there, but we haven't analyzed them. So with that, I'll conclude my part of the presentation. Thank you very much. That was great and well-timed. You were within 30 seconds of being told um, it was time. <laughs> So um, what we're going to do is anyone in the audience that might have questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. Um, we'll give it about you know, 10, 15 seconds from now. And if there's nothing, we can always come back and ask Brent at the end of the presentation um, questions. So let's just give it um, a second. And while we're doing that, I'm just going to make sure we're going, we could go ahead and um, load up Drew. I think your second is what I understand it's been changed to. And, um, Oh, you want to go ahead and give them controls to Drew? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to switch and wait for anybody who's got any questions in the meantime. Thank you very much. That was really informative. Yep. Okay, we're switching. So Drew's got his... Okay, Drew. Um, I think I think what's showing now is your presentation. Yep. So let me give a brief introduction to Drew. Um, um, 
Drew is a, an associate professor with the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. Um, he also holds an adjunct faculty appointment in the University of Michigan's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, Drew conducts research through a range of hydrological science projects that explore methods for quantifying and communicating uncertainty. He received his PhD from Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment and much of his recent research has focused on monitoring, analyzing, and forecasting the long-term water budget and water levels of the Laurentian Great Lakes. So, Drew, um, it's all yours. Okay, Nancy, can I just confirm that you can hear me okay? I can hear you wonderfully. Hopefully everyone else can. We'll just check the chat if anyone has any problems and I'll interrupt. Sounds so. great. Thank you for the introduction. And thanks everyone for taking the time to listen into this series of talks. Again, my name is Drew Grunewald. Um, coming to you from the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. And my talk is divided into three parts. First, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to the Great Lakes, particularly from a hydrologic science perspective, looking at the complexity of the processes that we try to understand, uh, as well as the overall magnitude of the lakes and some of the challenges we face when we try to represent the Great Lakes in hydrologic data and hydrologic models. Second, I want to take a look, a uh, closer look at the hydrologic cycle and take a look at some of the changes in the hydrologic cycle over time with respect to precipitation, evaporation, both on interannual scales as well as seasonal scales. And then third and finally, I want to leave you with a few concluding remarks, including two key gaps that we're identifying in current research and some ideas for filling those gaps. Uh, so to begin, I'd like to start off with this satellite image of the Great Lakes. It's a little bit of an unconventional image we're looking at the Great Lakes here from west to east. So if you can see my hand in the bottom of the screen, where my hand is sort of slowly circling is Duluth, Minnesota. This is the northwestern shoreline of Lake Superior. And then where my hand is now is over along the western shoreline of Lake Michigan. And there's an awful lot going, in this, going on in this picture, but a few highlights. First of all, this satellite image taken from NASA is from December of 1999. Now there's two important parts of that date. The first is that in December, this is the time of year when evaporation on the across the Great Lakes typically reaches a seasonal maximum. And you can see a lot of cloud formation across the lakes, but at the same time, there's a lot of latent heat uh, transfer, in other words, evaporation coming off the lakes. It was also in 1999, a time period where there was an extreme jump in evaporation due to an increase in lake temperatures. And there's been a lot of research done on the causes behind that, um, but a lot of it was linked to um, changes in cloud cover, as well as the onset of a strong winter El Nino. Again, there's been a lot more research done on that. And finally, what I want to point out to you is just the spatial heterogeneity of the processes across this image. So if you look at the land surface, for example, where a lot of hydrological modeling is typically focused, you can see that there's a lot of snow, particularly here in Wisconsin and Minnesota, but if you go on the other side of the lake, Michigan and Ohio, there's not a lot of snow. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the Great Lakes Basin, we have to consider the Canadian land surface as well. But then a major point that underscores some of what Brent talked about is that to understand the hydrology of the Great Lakes, you have to resolve the lakes themselves. And there's an awful lot going on out over the surface of the lakes and within the lakes that simply isn't represented by conventional regional climate models and land surface models, and that's a huge gap in research that this region continues to try to fill. Another major challenge that's faced is, uh, has to do with geopolitical boundaries and their impact on data and model development. This is a, a, the first page of a paper we wrote on this topic several years ago with colleagues from Environment and Climate Change Canada. And if I zoom in on the image that you see there, what we're looking at is a map of the major continental international basins on North America. So for example, up here in the upper left, you can see the Yukon River Basin. Here's the Columbia River Basin that I'm outlining, the Colorado and the Rio Grande. And then of course, here in red, I'm outlining the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin. And this is a logical perspective to take on watershed delineation and the development of data and products. Well, because of a long history of how um, national governments work, here is how we've divided up our perspective on the Great Lakes within the United States, particularly with regards to NOAA's National Weather Service River Forecasting Centers. 
So as you can see, the Columbia River Basin is, is addressed pretty well by the Northwest River Forecasting Center. The Rio Grande is addressed by the West Gulf River Forecasting Center. But there's no single entity within NOAA or really any other federal agency that cohesively and comprehensively addresses the entire hydrologic cycle of the Great Lakes. In fact, the agency most people look to is the International Joint Commission, the binational agency between US and Canada responsible for managing water levels and other water disputes across the Great Lakes and across the entire international border. So filling this gap in hydrological knowledge is a major goal of a lot of institutions uh, here in Michigan, including the University of Michigan, as well as NOAA and other partners. So what I'm gonna do is shift now and talk a little bit more about the Great Lakes hydrologic cycle and changes that we've seen in the hydrologic cycle on long-term and seasonal time scales. And to do that, I want to briefly go over again the flow of water through the system. This is a very simple map of the Great Lakes. The tan area represents the boundary of the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, so in general, water flows from Lake Superior through the St. Mary's River into Lake Huron. And water between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan interchanges uh, through the deep and wide Straits of Mackinac here but ultimately flows out through the St. Clair River, through the Detroit River into Lake Erie, and then drops over the Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, and then eventually out through the St. Lawrence River into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, if we're going to look at the water flowing through the system, there are two perspectives we can take. One is looking at how water flows within each one of these basins for each of the Great Lakes, and then we can look at water that flows between each one of those basins. So I'm going to shift here to a picture of the entire Great Lakes Basin and then how we would divide that up into the basins for each of the individual Great Lakes. So this is the sort of geographic foundation for the data I'm about to show you. So in this next slide, here's a general summary of the relative magnitude of each of the major components of the Great Lakes water balance. On the left-hand side, we see a graphical summary of the three major components of, of water, of the water budget from within each one of the lake's basins. So for example, uh, for Lake Superior, we have a representation here of the three major components uh, runoff, which is the lateral tributary runoff that comes into each lake, that's in green here. The number at the top of that bar represents the total average flow of water into Lake Superior on an annual time scale, and it's represented in thousands of cubic meters per second. So that number essentially is 1,600 cubic meters per second. The total amount of water coming into Lake Superior through over lake precipitation, which is this blue bar, is around 2,000 cubic meters per second. And it's worth mentioning, as Brent mentioned, that there's really no other freshwater system on Earth where you have a dynamic like this, where the amount of water entering the system through precipitation that falls directly on the surface of the predominant freshwater body is more than that that comes in through runoff. Typically in hydrological modeling, we're just concerned with river runoff and streams and how that makes its way across a continent. And then finally, this pink bar here represents the amount of water lost through over lake evaporation. And the number there is roughly 1,400 cubic meters per second. So you can see the numbers here for the other lakes, but the take home message here is that over lake precipitation, over lake evaporation uh, and runoff all have comparable values on annual time scales. One of the things that drives the water balance is the seasonal variability in each one of those components. Now, if we shift to the right-hand side of the screen, we're looking at the flow in between each one of the lake basins. So for example, water that leaves Lake Superior does so on average at a rate of about 2,200 cubic meters per second. It makes its way through the system. And what I wanna point out here is that by the time water leaves the Great Lakes system through the St. Lawrence River, just at the outlet of Lake Ontario, the annual average flow is 7,000 cubic meters per second. That's an extraordinarily high rate of flow. That's a continental scale discharge. And in fact, by the time the St. Lawrence River reaches the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the annual average flow is close to 16,000 cubic meters per second. And guess what? That's just about the same annual average flow rate as the Mississippi River. So from a hydrologic modeling and a continental water balance perspective, uh, the Grand Lord St. Lawrence Seaway uh, and, and water budget and high watershed is just as significant um, as the Mississippi, but very few people know that in part because it drains out through Canada um, and isn't often compared directly. So that's a huge foundation for a lot of the hydrologic 
science and the motivation for our research. So here's a look at how some of these components have been changing over time, along with their relationship to water levels. This is an image taken from a paper we published in 2013. And what you're seeing here, first of all, on the x-axis, we're looking at time and years going back all the way to 1860. And then the vertical axis here shows surface water elevations on each of the major lakes. So for each lake, uh, I'm showing you two data sets. The blue line, for example, here for Lake Superior is annual water level. The bars that you see are reflected on the right-hand axis, and that's a precipitation <clears throat> anomaly. So the orange bars are, represent below average um, precipitation anomalies, and the green bars represent above average precipitation anomalies. Two important take-home points here. One is that um, precipitation over the past several decades has, on average, been higher across most of the lakes than it was in the previous few decades. But the other point I want to mention is that for much of the historical record, water level dynamics tended to match variability in precipitation, but that dynamic changed in the late 1990s. You can see that here in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron where I'm circling, <clears throat> where water levels plummeted over several years, but there wasn't a corresponding uh, dramatic change in precipitation. If I advance one slide to show the same plot, but looking instead at evaporation, we can see a lot of the explanation for what happened here. <clears throat> this is showing the same plot and the same water level data in blue, but instead I'm showing over lake evaporation anomalies. And you can see the rapid rise in evaporation during this time period. And what our research has shown is that this provides really the best explanation for why water levels declined during that time period. Now, there was a lot of debate in the Great Lakes about why water levels declined during that time period. And there were even lobbying agencies suggesting that it was a mystery, that there wasn't enough science to explain where water had gone, that water levels had declined because of being shipped out through the shipping industry, or because of dredging projects, or because of water use. And one of the lobbying groups even concocted this sort of graphical image of some large drain in the middle of Lake Huron that was the best explanation for where water might be going. We, we responded to that with uh, some good, solid science that was actually published in the journal Science that showed a clear linkage here, as Brent was suggesting, between the changes in temperature across the lake. That's what's in this top panel here, where the dark blue bar represents Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. The light blue represents Lake Superior. And you can see this profound jump in surface water temperature in the late 1990s corresponding and even driving the large jump in evaporation during that time period that subsequently led to this drop and sustained drop in water levels, leading to record low levels uh, A and B, two time periods where there were monthly low records on Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron. So that's a look at sort of long-term changes in precipitation and evaporation. But this slide shows a different perspective and a look at what's happening from a seasonal perspective this is from a paper we published in VAMS in 2014, and what it's showing is lake, excuse me, month-to-month -month changes in lake level, specifically for Lake Erie, going back all the way to 1860. So, for example, if you look in this first panel here that's labeled October, each one of these vertical bars, mostly colored red, some blue, shows the magnitude of water level change on Lake Erie from October to the following month, November, in every single year in record. So in other words, it, when you're in the month of October, more often than not, water levels go down on Lake Erie from October to November by about 0.1 to 0.15 meters. And this black trend line indicates that there hasn't been a lot of change in that over time. What's really compelling is that on the Great Lakes and in other freshwater systems around the continent, we're seeing the impact of climate change in terms of an impact on a shift in how water enters the system through lateral tributary runoff. So in November, December, and January, it's now becoming more likely for water levels to rise from month to month than it is for them to decline. And interestingly, in March and April, uh, even though water levels are still rising in March and April due to spring runoff, it's um, less likely for them to rise as much, and that rate is on the decline. So a very interesting sort of shift in the entire hydrology of the Great Lakes Basin reflected here through the water levels on Lake Erie. So to wrap things up, two key points I want to make. Uh, 
that really focus on what I see as gaps in Great Lakes regional hydrologic science research and climate research and ideas for how to fill them. The, the first idea here is we are often asked about how we can improve seasonal and sub-seasonal forecasting for the region. And the response is very similar to, to other regions. We need to get a better idea of how the major air masses across the continent are bringing temperature and changes in moisture to a particular region. Within the Great Lakes, we have a very complicated system because of where the jet stream is and because the periodic uh, perturbations in the Arctic polar vortex uh, and Arctic polar vortex deformations. So I would argue that one of the more important research topics would be to get a better understanding of how these air masses are changing, and in particular, whether or not Arctic air masses uh, and their deformations are becoming more frequent and changing in magnitude, and specifically how those are affecting the Great Lakes hydrologic cycle. I think there's also a need to transfer that knowledge to seasonal and long-term changes in precipitation. This is another slide that more generally summarizes long-term changes in precipitation across the entire Great Lakes Basin. And again, this is similar with many other regions around the country where, on average, it's getting wetter. But we need to have a good understanding of the mechanisms from an air mass perspective as to why, so we can better reflect them in our models and better reflect them in forecasting systems. And finally, I want to leave you with this slide where I think a lot of these gaps have been manifest over the past several years. Uh, I haven't mentioned it yet, but it's worth noting that this past spring, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario both reached all-time record high water levels in records that go back over 150 years. There was extensive flooding along both shorelines, and Governor Cuomo and the state of New York are preparing legal action against the International Joint Commission in response to what they see as mismanagement of the lakes and water levels. What I find fascinating are the two different stories you see in the images here. The one on the left is the spring flood potential, uh, the risk potential issued by the Office of Water Prediction, with a big emphasis on what might be happening in the Mississippi River, in the Mississippi River Basin. What I find compelling is that if you look along the shoreline of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, there's absolutely no indication of what was about to come, which was extensive flooding and record high water levels along that entire shoreline. And part of why uh, is because NOAA right now and other agencies don't have a comprehensive basin-wide forecasting system that might have the potential to take into consideration data, readily available data, like what we see on the right-hand side, which comes from the National Operational Hydrological Remote Sensing Center, or NORIS, also within NOAA, that shows here significant potential for flooding based on the extensive snowpack along the region, both on the U.S. and, importantly, on the Canadian side of the border within the Great Lakes Basin that ultimately led to a lot of water coming into not only Lake Ontario, but also just downstream and caused major headaches for how to regulate water levels on Lake Ontario during that spring rise. So that ends uh, this portion of my talk and uh, looking forward to answering the questions as they come up uh, later throughout the session. So thank you again for listening. Thank you, Drew. Thank you very much. And um, I think what we're going to do is, is, as you have questions, go ahead and type them in. But we're going to assume that questions will come at the end unless I see one. So we're going to start preparing for Ed's um, presentation. Um, while we, we relinquish um, rights to uh, Brent and Ed gets them, let me just introduce Ed on the phone. Um, Ed Rutherford is a research fisheries biologist whose specialties are in fish population dynamics, larval fish ecology, bioenergetics modeling, and fisheries management of NOAA's Great Lake Environment Research Lab. His PhD is in marine environmental sciences from the University of Maryland. And he has, if you look at his bio, he has numerous publications in this realm. Um, Let's see if we have any questions real quick. Um, I don't think so. No. OK. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to give Ed control right now. OK. Um, oh, you have control now, I think, Ed, of the um, desktop. And we'll let you know if we can't hear you. Here. One more. No. Here we go. No, that's that's my email. <laughs> Should get it, yeah. 
Yeah, there you go. Great. Can you see the slides and can you hear me now? Yes, we can do both. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. first of all, I want to acknowledge my uh, colleague, Doran Mason, who's uh, in, had input into this talk and he's a fish ecologist here at NOAA's Laurel. Um, I'm going to talk about um, how the uh, changes in the physical environment, along with other stressors, particularly invasive species and nutrient inputs have affected Great Lakes food webs and fisheries. And on the right, um, well, in the middle, if you haven't seen one before, that's the mouth of an invasive sea lamprey, which is a parasite, which causes mortality on Great Lakes fishes. And on the right is um, my dear wife, Mary Lynn, catching a native lake trout in Grand Traverse Bay cold water fish. So a little bit of background about Great Lakes fisheries. Um, they are actually extremely important, important to the economy and recreation ecosystem services of the Great Lakes. Uh, they're estimated at being worth over $7 billion annually and supporting you know, over 75,000 jobs. Uh, they support commercial, uh, smaller commercial fisheries and much larger recreational fisheries. And the recreational fishery is a world-class recreational fishery. People travel to the Great Lakes to fish for these freshwater species. Um, unlike uh, NOAA's uh, jurisdiction over the management of uh, marine fisheries, NOAA does not manage the Great Lakes fisheries. Um, we participate uh, through advice and counsel. Uh, the the uh, Great Lakes fisheries are actually managed by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. And just like the International Joint Commission that, that uh, Drew mentioned, uh, it's a binational uh, agency that helps states and the province of Ontario uh, do consensus-based management of the fisheries. Uh, the Native American tribes are also an important partner in this and uh, are, are participate in the commercial fisheries. So if you look at fish, they're, um, they can't regulate their own temperature, so they're uh, susceptible to the, their environment. And uh, we have guilds of cold water fishes, uh, warm, cool water fishes, and warm water fishes. Um, we have imported some species from the West Coast that we like, uh, like Chinook salmon, like uh, uh, anatomous rainbow trout or steelhead like coho salmon. And we also have native cold water fish like the white fish, which I'll sp speak more about, uh, lake trout. And then um, some of the, the warmer water fish, um, smallmouth bass um, and bluegills are quite commonly caught in freshwater lakes um, and support good recreational fisheries. And we think that there are going to be some winners and losers in the climate change as uh, lake temperatures heat up. The winners are going to be these warm water fishes, and losers are going to be species that spawn near shore that are more susceptible to warming waters, like whitefish. And then there are those that are cool water fishes, such as walleye and yellow perch. Um, they're also popular. Uh, uh, sport fishes. It's not readily apparent how they will be affected. We are starting to understand that uh, these species, even though they uh, prefer slightly warmer temperatures than cold water fish, they need an extended period of winter of cold water to promote good uh, development of their eggs and have um, successful reproduction. So, uh, Another thing to know about our Great Lakes fishes is that we have estimates of between 75% and 90% of all Great Lakes fishes depend on tributary and near shore or wetland habitats through some part of their life cycle. So this is a diagram of the life cycle of 
of, uh, of a Chinook salmon coming in in the fall, depositing the eggs, which then hatch out in the spring, uh, rear in the stream habitat, and then move out into the lake uh, for, and spend their, their life for a few years in the lake. There are many other species native and introduced that, that uh, use this. Now, they also are reliant upon the hydrology of these tributaries and lake levels that affect their wetland uh, nursery habitats. So changes in to, to these habitats, these physical habitats that are, um, that are, are dramatic have consequences to their uh, reproductive success and abundance, and then to fisheries. So here's a slide on top that shows the percent ice cover dropping over time from 1975 down to uh, uh, present. There's, there's a lot of variability in this record, and this is for the Great Lakes, all the, the percent ice cover over all the Great Lakes uh, but we've, we're losing ice cover as the climate warms. And that's, that's not really surprising, but many of our fishes do depend on significant ice cover to um, rear or uh, to spawn and rear or form, um, form eggs. And at the same time, over this period of record, we've had introductions of in invasive species most significantly recently is the quagga mussel shown here on the left, which um, the zebra mussel, uh, which inhabits near shore zones, came in around the late 1980s, early 90s, and uh, has had some effect on our deep water lakes. But when the quagga mussel uh, really erupted in some of our deep water lakes in the mid 2000s or early 2000s, it had the effect of uh, changing the cycling of, of um, phosphorus, the limiting nutrient, uh, causing harmful algal blooms, retention, retaining phosphorus near shore, clearing the water, which promotes these um, uh, muck, which is decaying uh, aquatic vegetation and, and phytoplankton, and at the same time depriving the offshore zone which is habitat for many of our cold water fishes of nutrients. So we have too much in the near shore zone and too, too little in the offshore zone. So fortunately, we have long-term records of the food web response. Um, much of it is collected by our lab, so on the left, you can see a record of the spring chlorophyll A concentration starting in 1983. This is in southeast Lake Michigan, up through present with a, with a few years break. Um, and you can notice the trends are that uh, although variable, we're still getting sort of an average between uh, one and two micrograms per liter of chlorophyll in southeast Lake Michigan up through 2002. Um, the quagga mussel really erupted in that area in 2004, and since then it's cut it nearly in half. So that's the base of the food web that supports fish. You can also see the response over the same time period in zooplankton biomass, the next step up the food web. And here's a time series of fish production on the right. These are data from the USGS Great Lakes Science Center um, here in town, and they sample all of the Great Lakes. And this is for Lake Michigan, and you can see a peak in the biomass in the late 1980s of prey fish production, and then a steep decline, which we think has been caused both by declining nutrients through purposeful phosphorus controls, but then also introductions of these invasive species. So some of our uh, recent research on climate change effects on food webs, fisheries, and invasives are, uh, we have since, I guess off and on since the early 2000s, lo uh, looking at survival and growth 
Uh, in early life of Great Lakes prey fish, this would include the walleye, the yellow perch, and some of the prey fish species, uh, alewife, which supports the salmon fishery. Um, we've been looking at uh, stratification uh, through that record that Brent mentioned from the southern basin of Lake Michigan. Um, how long is the lake stratified for in response to climate warming? And then uh, trying to tease that apart from the effects of invasive species on productivity of lower trophic levels. We've been looking at uh, interactive effects of nutrient loads, climate, and invasive species on food webs using three different types of models, uh, an individual-based bioenergetics model, a um, slightly less complicated but more species food web model called EcoPath with EcoSim that's widely used to look at uh, effects on marine fisheries, and then uh, an end-to-end -end ecosystem model that links um, hydrodynamics and uh, geochemistry with food web response called it the Atlantis ecosystem model to look at the relative effects of these stressors on fisheries. But I want to highlight just two examples um, looking at early life survival of lake whitefish and then predicting habitat suitability as lakes warm for a native species and an invasive species. So the example for um, uh, early life survival is looking at lake whitefish, which is again one of our cold water fish. Fishes, it spawns in, in uh, rears near shore and it spawns in late fall. Um, it deposits its eggs right near shore on hard substrates and it depends on reliable ice cover over winter to prevent uh, disruption by waves and wind of the eggs um, from that, that uh, substrate. Uh, if there is no ice cover, we know from long-term data records that reproduct reproductive success is very low. And the larvae hatch out in the spring. Um, and if there's, um, we're having an invasive effect now from the mussels. We, if, if the area in which they hatch out is, uh, has low productivity, um, their growth rate slows, and we have uh, seen reduced survival of those young. And so here's a time series. I just want to focus on the relative survival to the fishery of two lake white fish stocks. Uh, one in Whitefish Bay, Lake Superior. Uh, it is warming, but it still has significant ice cover well, from 1981 up through near present, shown in orange. And then you can see the time series from a stock in one of the lower lakes in, in Lake Huron which actually increased up to the early 2000s and then has seen a precipitous decline. And we think that this variability um, is due to, at least due to a change in the percent ice cover over the lakes, shown on the right. But then we also suspect that there's, there's po there potentially an effect of invasive species, primarily the quagga mussel, reducing the productivity in their specific areas. So our lab is participating in a multi-agency study to look at the early life survival of lake whitefish in, in shallow nearshore areas. You can see the agencies and the universities listed here. And they've been doing this uh, for the last six or seven years. It actually takes that long now for young to develop to grow into the size at which they're harvested. But they're looking at the bottlenecks to the survival in the early life history. We're also looking at the potential habitat suitability for fish, uh, given climate scenarios using coupled model systems. And, and these, this is a diagram to illustrate um, how we can use knowledge of the water temperature in a particular cell in the water column and if we have knowledge of the density and size of prey for a given fish species or life stage and its water temperature, we can predict um, 
In a foraging model, we can predict using bioenergetics its potential growth rate in that cell. And using that information, and this is a cartoon of a um, biophysical model that our colleague Mark Rowe here at our lab uses, which combines um, uh, the finite volume coastal ocean model, modeling of currents and temperature um, with nutrients and models the lower trophic level to predict um, physical and biotic um, environments for fish at any point in the water, in any location in the water cycle, we can, or water column, we can predict the growth rate uh, under different scenarios of climate. And so here's a result of that uh, scenario prediction for lake trout, as shown on the left again. And there are, this is the modeling the change in weight over time through the life cycle of a lake trout. It's by my colleague Yuchun Cao at Michigan State. Um, under different scenarios of consumption of prey and compared to um, a, a constant consumption rate, which is mer uh, shown here at sort of a normal temperature range. And under a very optimistic highest possible consumption rate, of course, they're going to grow well. Um, a reduced consumption rate shown here is which we think is going to be the case under climate effects on the food web shows that, that our fish will be growing at a slower rate. And actually, we are starting to observe lower growth rates of our native deep water fishes. So you may have heard about Asian carp. Um, these are, this is a picture of silver carp flying through the air um, in the Illinois River, which is a tributary. Uh, it's connected to the, right near Chicago, um, which used to drain into the Illinois, down into the Mississippi River drainage. And these invasive speed, uh, fish have moved up the Mississippi River drainage, and they're poised to enter the Great Lakes. So one of the things we're working on is where are they going to get in? Um, how abundant will they be? Is their habitat suitable for growth? And uh, Peter Alsip, who was a grad student working with us, um, used that bioenergetic model, to, model approach to run some simulations comparing um, a warm year in 1998 um, compared to a cool year, 1997, uh, and looking at the potential for these fish to grow. And the red, dark red indicates they're going to do very well. So we think they'll go to Green Bay. If they're in Green Bay, they'll grow very well. But overall, the whole Lake Michigan, and this is done <clears throat> in three dimensions, that they should have some positive growth relative to um, these other scenarios. The, the, re the uh, reference here is the um, 2010, and then this is the cool year again, it's 1997. So um, we can use these tools, a couple of modeling tools, to look at the potential habitat suitability for native and invasive species. So some of our research gaps. Winter ecology is a huge gap. Um, you've seen that huge ice flow that Brent showed, showed you earlier. It's really tough to sample uh, over ice in the wintertime in the Great Lakes. Um, I've done it for a couple of years in Green Bay. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> but um, we think that using um, tools like uh, AUVs under the ice, um, and uh, we can gain a lot of knowledge. And we just had a symposium here among Great Lakes scientists to, to see what the research questions are. And uh, we're going to, uh, Hank Vanderplug, who's our e ecosystem dynamics lead, is going to put that out soon. We know and suspect that there are probably going to be geochemical effects of climate change, which certainly would affect the food web. Um, the stoichiometry of carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus 
has to be at a certain ratio to be uh, taken up by members of the food web. And when that changes through introduction of invasive species or changes in precipitation and runoff, um, that's going to affect that ratio and, and also food web production. We have a great knowledge gap about the microbial food web, um, especially because we've had invasive species like Dreisena come in, which has reduced the biomass of, of phytoplankton and mesozooplankton, but actually increased the, the uh, biomass, or not increased, but uh, even reduced the microzooplankton, uh, but its relative importance to the food web that supports fish is, is unknown. And then given this recent change in climate uh, and weather over the Great Lakes, fish, uh, most fish that are harvested live uh, several years between anywhere from three to 25 or 30 years. And so knowing how a variability in climate will affect their pro production is, is a large unknown. So future directions, we, we're using various statistical and modeling tools to look at the relative effects of these uh, climate change and stressors on fish recruitment and abundance. Um, this is an example of the temperature difference from the long-term mean from year to year. Um, and uh, our benthic ecologist, Ashley Elgin, has used a, a structural equation modeling approach to look at how, try and tease out the effects of climate warming in some years um, versus the effects of the mussels on the lower food web have affected um, zooplankton dynamics. And um, here's just an example of some of that, that conceptual model and some of the players in the food web. So at this point, I'll take any questions. This is, this, this is me on an airboat in the middle of Green Bay in the winter of 2010, I believe, drilling a hole in the ice. And, and um, there have been episodes of hypoxia uh, associated with high nutrient loads and, and uh, ice cover um, that affects survival of those uh, fall spawning fish that spawn near shore. So we were one of the studies we've been using to try and look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And those final pictures are quite impressive. <clears throat> Um, I think what we're going to do is go on to the, our fourth presenter, and then we'll, we'll take questions at the end at this point. Um, our final presenter today, thank you very much. Um, our final presenter today is Greg Doucette. Uh, he's a research oceanographer and serves as a program lead for the Harmful Algal, algal Blooms Sensor Development in the Harmful Algal Bloom Monitoring and Research Branch with the NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Service. This effort focuses on developing and deploying field portable and autonomous in situ sensor technologies to detect and measure ab toxin levels in U.S. coastal waters, including the Great Lakes. So we're going to turn it over to you, Greg. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you hear me okay now? Yep. Everything is great. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you again for um, uh, having me this afternoon, and I'd like to just uh, start with a, uh, a quick shout out to the many uh, folks that collaborated on this work shown here, um, our folks at the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science, also uh, actually Reagan Herrera, who is um, uh, with the folks at, at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, um, Atlantic uh, Oceanographic and Meteorological Lab is also part of LAR and um, the uh, Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research, and uh, a big shout out to the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, um, who have been very uh, important in developing some of these technologies. So it's a little bit of a, a shift in uh, gears here from the previous talk, so I'll be focusing a little bit more on the um, uh, observing technologies that we're using to look at uh, cyanobacterial blooms and uh, their associated toxicity which are, um, in fact, um, subject to uh, impact of climate change. But uh, also, um, these technologies will find applications looking 
uh, at other aspects of uh, climate change impact on other parts of the, uh, the ecosystem and the food web uh, in particular, some of which were mentioned by the previous speakers. So um, just a, a quick introductory slide. Most of you are probably well aware that harmful algal blooms caused by cyanobacteria as well as the toxins that they produce are not good things um, and can adversely impact um, a variety of different um, freshwater uh, systems, inland, inland lakes, et cetera, as well as uh, obviously the Great Lakes uh, in a variety of different ways, some of which I've listed here, uh, ranging from fish kills to shading, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, um, fairly effective in that way. Um, also significant um, risks to uh, both human and animal health, as well as um, impacts as shown over here related to uh, water treatment, uh, not only cost, but also closure and other uh, problems related to general sort of aesthetics and quality of life um, effects shown here. Uh, as far as the blooms themselves are concerned, uh, there are a number of environmental factors that can control these cyanobacterial blooms. Um, and many of those environmental factors interact in various ways. And this is a really nice graphic that was put together by Hans Perl um, showing some of these, uh, these factors. And the, the point here is really that climate variability can really change how um, these, these factors interact. And from a high level, uh, direct interactions such as warming temperatures, uh, increased nutrient loading, leading to eutrophication, um, uh, greater hydrologic variability and extremes uh, related to say stronger storms or drought conditions are all things that can directly impact these blooms. But they can also interact um, in synergistic ways and sort of uh, generate these positive feedback loops that can actually actively promote uh, the formation of these blooms and, and in some cases, the mechanisms are related to modifying or altering the, uh, uh, the thresholds for blooms to actually occur. Um, so the, the, the bottom line uh, for us and many of our collaborators is that under these changing climate scenarios, um, it's really uh, critical and essential to be able to monitor these blooms uh, more effectively. And um, in terms of um, uh, several of these aspects are related to the detection of both the, the actual species that cause these blooms as well as the toxins. And uh, the, the ability to, uh, to detect these, these blooms um, in, a, uh, in an early warning sense as they're developing is critical. Uh, but in addition, actually looking at not only the cells, but the toxin levels associated with them is, is really important uh, due to obviously the impact of the, of the toxin levels. And the, the, the take home on this is that cells don't always equal toxin. In other words, we can have uh, high biomass levels with low toxins uh, associated with it and vice versa. Um, Regulatory applications in many uh, cases also mandate um, uh, observations and, and measuring and monitoring of, of toxin levels uh, to ensure safe uh, drinking and recreational waters. And the data that we generate from some of these uh, observing technologies is, um, is now and will uh, to a greater extent in the future feed into models uh, for forecasting these blooms as well as trying to discern some of the interim and uh, long-term trends that we might see in uh, a changing climate scenario. And finally, um, these data can also help us identify some of the drivers for uh, promoting growth and toxicity of the blooms. And as many of you probably are well aware now, these um, integrated observing networks um, throughout uh, the, uh, the world now and world oceans and, and freshwater systems are really changing how we monitor and interrogate the biology of these systems. Um, the uh, so-called ecogenomic sensors, uh, which effectively allow us to bring some of the analytical tools that we use to look at the molecular level of some of these uh, target species and organisms, uh, 
effectively helping us to bring these from the lab into the field. And <clears throat> when we are able to actually deploy some of these sensors on autonomous uh, unmanned platforms, it's starting to reshape the strategies that we use to actually monitor, manage, and mitigate uh, the blooms and some of their, uh, their impact. So what I'd like to do now, the, the primary focus here, is just look at some of the technologies that we're using. And one of these ecogenomic sensors, one of the earliest examples, and probably best example, is something called the Environmental Sample Processor, or the ESP. And the second generation of this instrument is actually shown here. Uh, these are actually um, uh, instruments that are owned and operated by our colleagues at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. Uh, and we contribute by uh, uh, enabling the, uh, the toxin detection by these, uh, uh, these um, uh, instruments. And so these, uh, the ESP in general is a, allows us to merge some contextual measurements with uh, information on genes and gene products. In other words, looking at species and toxins. And we can do this by acquiring and processing and analyzing samples autonomously and in situ. Um, and these, these uh, instruments are capable of uh, extended unattended offshore operations. In other words, we can put these things in the water for months at a time and, uh, and allow them to do their thing. And we can also communicate with them, and they can communicate with us. Um, so those two-way communications are important for not only data transmission in real time or near real time, but also allowing us, the operators, to modify the mission on the fly and also troubleshoot. So to give you a little bit of an idea of how these things work, what they're capable of, we've got a little video here down to the right. So the instrument itself is, is uh, contained in a pressure housing with a battery power, uh, uh, power pack. These are little uh, reaction chambers or pucks that contain filters that allow us to actually filter and capture water, uh, the organisms from water. We can uh, lyse those organisms, release the target for interest in, whether those be uh, nucleic acid, uh, looking at the genetics of the organism, or the toxins that the organisms are producing. And what's happening now is that sample is being tested or analyzed using a method that we would normally use on the laboratory bench. But the robotic system here is able to actually do that autonomously underwater. The results uh, photograph and the data are, uh, all those spots represent certain organisms or toxins and the data are transmitted uh, back to shore where they can be analyzed. Um, and, and acted upon it. So uh, that's just an idea of sort of what can be done with this instrument. Um, there have been several deployments of these uh, ESPs in Lake Erie, uh, a field trial back in 2016, followed by three years thus far of uh, deployments uh, where this uh, gold uh, or uh, blue star is, uh, just upstream of which we have water intake. And the way that this uh, is configured allows us to sample both near the surface and also near the bottom, as this um, instrument actually is on a lander that sits actually on the bottom of the, uh, the lake in, in, the, in the Western Basin. So this is an example. This is actually courtesy of, uh, of Reagan, um, showing the, the data that we've generated uh, with the ESPs, looking at particulate microcystin concentrations. And I don't have time to get into the details here, but basically what this instrument allows us to do is um, to effectively continuously monitor the levels of microcystin autonomously in the water uh, subsurface and at depth uh, close to the level at the, which the water intake is flowing water and uh, allows us to really capture some of these increasing uh, toxin concentrations quite effectively. Um, in in a, a larger sense, uh, when we think about the uh, toxin levels in the Great Lakes, this is another graphic that Reagan provided. Um, it's showing uh, the changes, and this is going from 2015 through 2019, sort of a continuous loop, but the, just pay attention to the, the changes in the, um, uh, specifically the red dots, and where those red dots are showing up, those are higher toxin levels. And the, the larger the red dot, the more toxin. Um, and so as you can get a sense that the um, intensity and the toxicity of these blooms is varying 
uh, over both space and time. And so those six location moorings, this is where the, the second generation of the QGE EFT is located, very useful for certain targeted sampling, but being able to actually move around the, the Western Basin is also uh, quite critical and can be very important. Um, so to address that, uh, that capability, um, this is a mobile version of the environmental sample processor. And again, I would say, um, note that our colleagues at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute are the ones that are developing this particular technology. Uh, we're working developing the actual toxin sensors that are deployed here, but the, the uh, long range autonomous underwater vehicles shown here um, and the, um, the re engineering of the environmental sample processor um, is being uh, contributed by our Embari colleagues. Um, the, LRAUV, the Long Range Atomic Underwater Vehicle, allows us to intelligently uh, track and sample the uh, targets that we're looking at, in particular the balloons. And this is what the, um, the modified version of the EST, this is the third generation, looks like. And the sample processing actually takes place on these little cartridges, which are on a wheel, and that wheel is able to rotate and we can index that wheel uh, as, we, as we need to during the course of the, uh, the deployment. And the analytical component is contained within this set of those little reaction pots. Everything's actually happening inside here. Um, and uh, together, that basically allows us for on the fly sample processing uh, and analysis and data transmission. So inside the, AUV, the work, um, well, it looks like this. There are two different kinds of those cartridges. Um, and I will just uh, briefly describe one of them can actually archive samples. In other words, add preservation. So the filters are located here. And the um, uh, reagents or the chemicals that we use to treat them are located in these little syringe barrels. So we can preserve or archive a sample. We can also take a sample and extract, let's just say, the toxin from it and then analyze it using a, uh, an antibody-based method. I'm not going to go into details there. Uh, or we can actually pull up uh, genetic components and uh, uh, use a, um, another um, uh, method that will allow us to actually look at uh, the genetic component of those uh, organisms that we've captured. So this is just briefly one of our, our initial try at putting this instrument out in Western Lake Erie. This was back in 2018. We have since uh, also deployed last year in 2019. Um, this shows that the, one of the tracks that we took that actually visited some of the real-time observing buoy stations that GLORAL uh, operates uh, that allowed us to take advantage of some of the contextual data being generated by those, uh, those stations. Um, and while we were underway, again, we were able to do on-the-fly uh, toxin analysis and archive samples. So we were up for five days, we pulled it back out, recharged the batteries, um, went back in, continued this um, uh, 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 mission in uh, looking at the, uh, visiting the different um, uh, buoy stations. And then we actually kind of switched gears a little bit and we started to actually uh, use uh, satellite data, uh, hyperspectral data uh, from flyovers done again by the Social Rural. Um, buoy data and some of that data, uh, other satellite data from uh, the NOAA HAP Bulletin to basically allow us to chase the bloom or direct our sampling towards uh, boundary areas and other hotspots that were of interest to us. So just two sort of different mechanisms of, of operation there. Um, so one of the, the major milestones of this um, deployment was our the first uh, detection of microcystin on a mobile autonomous platform um, in, uh, in the Great Lakes. And that was actually done close to the station four. This is what the data looked like that were transmitted back from the instrument, um, translating into about a uh, tenth of a microgram of microcystin per year. Uh, I don't have time to describe the technology to you, but I can address those in question. Um, the, um, one thing, so this is actually a nice graph of the um, microcystin concentrations that were measured by the AUV, but um, sort of in superimposed here are 
the archive samples that were processed post-deployment looking at the gene responsible for uh, toxin production, which is the MCYE gene. One of the things we're interested in, uh, and again, because some populations of microcystis carry the gene, some don't. And so we were interested to see if we could correlate the occurrence of the toxin uh, gene with the detection of toxin. And as you can see, there was very good correlation with the presence of the gene. Each one of these dots is, a, is an individual sample or a replicate sample. Um, the replicates were actually quite good, except for maybe the uh, uh, August 30th uh, rep. And uh, the way that we really need to go about trying to validate these types of data are actually with uh, very highly coordinated boat sampling, uh, which is actually um, something that we'll be looking at. Um, so where are we headed with this technology? Um, while we're looking at, these are Ambari's colleagues in Monterey Bay actually deploying uh, one of these AUVs, so you get an idea of what that looks like, um, is to actually uh, conduct multi-vehicle missions. And uh, <clears throat> as shown here, but also we did uh, last year, 2019, we deployed two AUVs in Western Lake Erie. One of them served as a sentinel, which allowed us to kind of map the bloom. And you can see one of the transects here. And then the second AUV actually carried the 3G ESP, which allowed us to take the inf information that was being generated by the Sentinel AUV and guide our um, uh, uh, interrogating uh, AUV to sites that we wanted to actually sample and measure toxin at. So um, very, you know, highly coordinated uh, uh, multi-vehicle mission, which was the uh, first time that had been done uh, in that area. Um, one of the things that NOAA is very interested in is trying to transition some of these technologies to an operational status uh, as being part of uh, NOAA's um, unmanned uh, fleet that uh, somewhere down the road. Uh, and we're also uh, looking to better define the strategies and use cases for uh, HAB management in terms of how these uh, the technology can be applied more effectively and most efficiently. And also, um, we're looking at uh, trying to identify applications to help us address some of the knowledge gaps related specifically to climate impacts on the biological dynamics of the Great Lakes. And uh, one of those um, is a good example would be primary production. And um, that's actually something that uh, several of the speakers uh, prior this afternoon have, have spoken about related to climate impacts on temperature, stratification, rainfall, forms, nutrients, how that affects the basal food web and primary production at a larger level uh, in terms of the composition of the phytoplankton, but the harmful algal blooms are really effectively a subset of this. And so changing the duration and extent and toxicity of those blooms, uh, as well as being um, promoting potentially the um, presence of some of the emerging species that might be more suited to these uh, warmer conditions. And um, in addition, uh, winter ecology has been mentioned already. Some of these AUVs are sub uh, capable of running uh, under the ice surface. Um, and also some of the, the uh, genetic types of sampling that we can do can address some of the biogeochemical cycling and specifically uh, interrogating the microbial food web, which is obviously critical for supporting some of the fish productivity. So those, those technologies that I've just uh, gone through can have multiple applications, uh, not only for the, the algal blooms, but also some of the other really more fundamental and basic uh, foundations of the, uh, the food web and the productivity of the, uh, of the Great Lakes. So with that, um, I will just uh, put up my acknowledgement slide and um, I can answer any questions as well. Thank you. Greg, thank you so very much. That that was great. I think what we did was we what we kind of went over time on everybody just because the presentations were so interesting. So instead of taking questions now, we're going to be ending. But what I'd like to do is ask you if you have questions to address them directly to those that presented them. And if you need us to act as an intermediary and send them forward, um, to go ahead and do that. 
Um, I'd like to also remind you that we're going to have another one of these uh, series uh, looking at water in the Great Lakes and the changing climate on January 10th, uh, where we're going to be looking at the socioeconomic aspects of it. And then finally, I'd like to thank our four speakers on behalf of Todd Christensen and uh, Jen Dobkowski, who are with me in the room. Um, and thank you all very much for participating and um, hopefully see you all in January. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.